Sovereign class battleships. Sovereign battleships. Now, this is where some of you do like to say, Alex, you know, they're called pre dreadnoughts And I know that was the classification made for them in World War I. Classification was done very quickly. It was a naval classification, and it was a classification put together to basically describe the differences between the dreadnoughts and the pre-dreadnoughts for quick, uh, quick and ease in estimations of operations and for journalists, etc. to follow which battleships are where, i.e. the dreadnoughts of the Grand Fleet versus the pre-dreadnoughts being sent to the Mediterranean. However... And this is a worthwhile, however. That is not a classification that sits well with me. Because... If I classify things by what comes after them... We tend to automatically put them at a disadvantage. And automatically think them lesser. And it isn't really the historical methodology. You classify going forward, you don't classify going aft. Unless, of course, we're going to compare Dreadnought to Jesus Christ. I don't think that quite makes sense. Because that was how we used to divide up the years before we came up with the idea of um, it used to be before Christ and then Anno Dominii after Christ, um, basically, or the year of our Lord, depending on how you wanted to phrase that. And now it's become BCE and CE before Common Era, Common Era. Marked on the same date. And it's that's always that always makes me laugh because basically that's going, okay, so we wanna we can't change all the dating system because so much work and so much body has been done in that dating system. We can't go back and retroactively change the dates. What we're gonna do is we're gonna change the year system and you know what? We're going to be really sneaky with it. We're going to make it before Common Era. Because then all you have to do is add an E onto the BC. And then that's all fine. And most people haven't offered, often haven't usually bothered to put AD. Or anything else after the years which have been the, what are now the Common Era or a Common Era. So, yeah, it's a really easy change to make, and you can slip it in. It's kind of like converting a pagan winter festival into the birthday of Christ. It's just a great trick. Everyone already wants to have a party that day, nothing else much to do. So let's take over that party. And, let's be honest, if you're not sure which day to pick, picking a day in the middle of winter when everyone's usually feeling pretty tired and mopey and not enjoying the uh, weather at all, to have a big party and celebrate being family and shared bonds, that's a pretty nice thing. Pretty good idea. Anyway. Tribals, battles, and daring's. And because this is entirely covers history roughly between the nineteen thirty to nineteen fifties, it doesn't have anything like that in it. Doesn't need to. But, the point I'm trying to make, and I know there was a 
possibly a little bit of a ramble there, but it's trying to give some context, is that we cannot describe battleships prior to the advent of HMS Dreadnought as pre-Dreadnoughts and be accurate for them. For starters, there are at least two distinct generations, and some people have made an argument, and a coherent argument, for three distinct generations of them. The trouble is, it gets kind of fishy with the third generation, because the third generation are sometimes called the semi-dreadnoughts, on the pre-dreadnoughts, and they're basically the ships which are being built around the time that dreadnought is actually built, and it's a kind of case of, um, okay, you basically, you don't want to call them pre-dreadnoughts because they're built after dreadnought, I can understand that one, I can understand it, you have some sense here, you have some points, but, um, there's also a small issue in that they're not, they're, they're, they're not. They are continuations of the previous design strategy. So you have to, technically you have to call them a pre-dreadnought, but they're built after dreadnought. Which is another reason why I don't like pre-dreadnought. Because it doesn't make sense when you look at the actual ships. It's an easy catch-all, but doesn't make sense. Which is why I come back with sovereigns. Now, what is the big difference between Sovereigns and the previous ones? Well, there's the hull type. It's an ocean-going hull. You notice there? She actually has a freeboard! <laughs> you can take her into these things called waves! And she doesn't immediately go, Oh, liquid! Oh! Were you all hoping to actually get home? You were? What a shame for you. Um, so she's rather useful. She has guns for aft, and then she has secondary guns mounted along sort of the main structure in the middle. But her secondary guns are more of her primary armament than her supposed heavy guns are. Now, you can sit there and go, well, Alex, those guns aren't in turrets, they're in casemates, so, you know. Well, hoods were in turrets, and that was part of it, but the Royal Sovereign class really is a transition. They have, within their class, they have all these points of transition. And all those points. But the trouble is, then you have a mess with the next class, uh, with the next things to come after them. Because if you then want to decide to call them the Centurion, uh, call things the Centurion class battleships, uh, and Centurion type battleships, um, well, the, unfortunately, they're second class battleships. And then after them, you have to wait, for, well, there's HMS Renown. Who's also another second class battleship. Okay. So you'd be waiting for the Majestic class. And you'd be calling the Majestics. By which point, quite a lot of people have got in there copying the Sovereign design and moving on. So you're basically left with, okay, we're going to have to go to Sovereigns. And they make sense. Sovereigns are good ships. They are a balanced design, which is what you needed. Yes, they have 13 and a half inch guns, four of them. And trust me, you're going to get sick of hearing me talk about 13 and a half inch guns in this video. There is a reason I make the joke that going for 12 inch guns was the most un British thing that could be chosen for HMS Dreadnought. She should have had 13 and a half inch guns. And. I have tested a Dreadnought design with 13 and a half inch guns on UAD last Friday, so it'll come out Wednesday, the, 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 tomorrow when this uh, when this video comes out, and you'll see she does pretty well with 13 and a half inch guns. They're pretty good things. So a decent 13 and a half inch gun instead of the 12 inch gun, if that had been available, would have been a a big thing. It would have also possibly caused a few other nations to go, ah, even earlier. And also there'd be the fun of the, the German Navy, because with their 11-inch guns, again, 11-inch, they go, well, you know, we have the capabilities. Our 11-inch does match up against the 12-inch. And broadly speaking, on the stats, you, they, you can say there is an even uh, an evenness between them. But the 11-inch to the 13-and-a-half-inch version is a case of... Um, 
Yeah, that just ain't gonna wash. It's good, but it ain't it ain't good enough for that one. They'd have to do some work on their guns. So this is the first of this series of slides that are in this particular video, and I wanted to present you with something which was basically these are the sovereign class sovereign style battleships this era's production runs. You have the Brandenburg class of the Kaiserlich Marine, uh, Brandenburg, Weisenberg, Kurfürst, uh, Kurfürst Friedrich Wilhelm, and then uh, Wurf comes out in 1892. This is when they're launched. It's worthwhile considering that because it's when they're launched. Uh, the German ships are an interesting bunch because Whilst the Royal Sovereigns are launched in 1891 and then completed 1892, um, 1893, broadly speaking, but 1892, 1893, usually within, at, you know, a fairly short amount of time from their actual construction, the German Navy, in terms of Brandenburg, managed to get her completed by November 1893. She actually comes after Worth. That's the interesting thing. Worth is launched in 1892 and is completed in October 1893. But there is the really interesting thing is that Weisenberg and Kurfürst Frederick Wilhelm, they're finished in 1894. And I mean, in Weisenberg's case, which is launched in 1891, in October, 1894. So she is laid down in May 1890, launched in December 1891, completed in October 1894. That's four and a half years. Roughly. Four and a half years. compared to Wurf, which is built by the uh, Jemwerft Kiel. And, well, she's laid down in March 1890, launched August 1892, and completed October 1893. Basically, you have your problem coming up here, there, because... It's the time spent to complete these ships. And I'll get into Brandenburg in a second, but here is the other point. The Royal Navy launched the Royal so first batch of Royal Sovereigns in 1891. That includes Hood, which has turrets. Then you have more Royal Sovereigns coming out, a lot launching in 1892, and also some Centurions. Then you have a gap for 1893, where basically the Royal Navy spends the time watching French ships being launched, and some American vessels coming on, including Indiana, Massachusetts, and Oregon. Uh, they're the Indiana class, and they are a really good bunch of ships. And the Russians even launch some ships. But that's in 1894 and 1895. Always nice to know that they're going to be coming. And... Um, I should have blacked out the bit below the Majestic class, or between Majestic and uh, Renowned, that space. Sorry, there's a little space up there which should have been blacked out. And pretty much, that's what they're producing. But look at the sheer quantity over this side. The Royal Navy has produced, not four, not a, but within the first two years, you have nine, nine, hang on, just checking my mouse, yes, nine, and then in 1894 and 1895, they have six more, so they've launched 15, Germany, has launched four. France 
I, I'm going to avoid looking at French ships in this period. I'm going to have to do a special at some point when I get back from Australia on the French ships of this period just to explain to you what the true definition of and then it got worse, or rather, then it got worse. Worst and worser and worstest really are. I am inventing new versions of worse because, frankly, you have to for the French. Honestly, I'm I'm surprised the Royal Navy and the US Navy just didn't get together, probably with the Kaiserlich Marine, and just turn up in France and go, please just hand over your navy, we'll take them out to sea, we'll sink them, and we'll save the world. Okay, just, just stop it, go back, reset, find a part of you which produces good-looking ships, and um, we'll, we'll forget about it. We, we come to do this intervention for your own behalf. It's, it's not out of war, it's out of necessity for our eyesight. We're literally, we have good looking ships. Indiana class, good looking ships, fine ships. So, why did the Brandenburg class take so long to actually get finished? What's the problem for Germany? Well, it's the trouble for Germany starts with. Uh, Kerfurst Friedrich Wilhelm's test revealed that her propulsion machinery um, was atrocious. Brandenburg managed to have a boiler explosion during sea, sea trials in 1894. This is after she had theoretically been completed, and that managed to kill 44 men, 25 of them crew, uh, crew 18 shipyard workers, and uh, one from the commission evaluating the trials. This was caused by an incorrectly manufactured valve in the starboard engine. After this, these were the, interesting enough, these were the last four ships to undergo builders' trials before formal acceptance was by the Kaiserlich Marine. From this point onwards, after Worf is in is in is in service. The German ships undergo testing after commissioning. Which is another interesting thing because the Royal Navy would tell you no, you take them out testing while it's still technically going by the builders, and if it doesn't work, you return it to builders and tell them to fix it or they're not getting their money. But apparently the German Navy wasn't in a position to say that. Um, you do run the trials for the builders. You make sure there's a large naval person, a body of naval personnel aboard, making sure they're not trying to pull a fast one. But um, yeah, you don't take that ship until they until it's working, under any circumstances. First rule of procurement: never take anything until it works. They had an interesting career. They were useful vessels. They took part, well, how do I put this? The Kurfürst Friedrich Wilhelm and Wiesenberg, uh, Weisenberg uh, became the Barbaros Harden and uh, Turgut Riss, which meant that they were, how do I put this politely, some of the vessels at the Battle of Lemos. Yep. Now, of course, the Battle of Lemos is where one armoured cruiser beats up two pre general battleships. So I don't think I need to say um, more, do I? Really? Under the circumstances. But they were, they were a nice attempt. But also, again, this is the point. They are built in... They are launched... Back in the 1890s. They're fighting a battle in the 1910s. And um, life doesn't go well. And then we have here Sisoy Veliki. Now. She has the joy of being sunk at the Battle of Tashima. She was launched 
in 1894 as part of a group of vessels built for the Baltic Fleet. So, she's built for the Baltic and she ends up being sunk in the Pacific. She's not a bad design. Not really. She has four 12 inch guns, two four to aft. She has six 6 inch guns, 12 1.9 inch, that's 47 millimeter guns, 18 one and a half inch or 37 millimeter guns, six 15 inch torpedo tubes, a waterline belt of between six and 14 inches, 10 inch barbettes, 12 inch gun uh, armor on the gun turrets, casemates of five inches, deck two and a half to three inches thick, conning tower nine inches, bulkheads between six and nine inches. She's a decent workman workhorse design for a battleship. For the 1890s. And this is a real point to consider. She's being built in the 1890s. Unfortunately for her, she is also a Russian ship, which means they regularly like to improve her armament and her design without remembering the fact that they have the same weight, they say have the same displacement limits as they originally did, that they have the same engines as they originally did, and therefore they're going to keep overloading these things. And that's what they do. They do keep overloading them. Repeatedly. But she is a good example of the designs available and the designs coming in. She is a good example of what was being considered in the 1890s outside the United Kingdom, outside of America, and to extent Germany. But she is also a response to the Brandenburg class, and I have no doubt in saying I would want to be in Neva, Neva in a fight. You know, one. Its armor's fairly decent, but its engines are trying to kill me. The other one, it's had a load of people poking holes in its, holes in its structural integrity to add in more guns, because apparently Russia in this time period had drunk the, I don't know, the, uh, the American we uh, West uh, Kool-Aid and believed that actually having more and more guns was the answer rather than being good with the guns you do have. You know, they were the kind of guy who turned up with 12 six-shooters on him. Going, yeah, I'm armed. And he's sort of going, well, you, you, you could have just carried some more spare rounds and only carried two. Because carrying six, how are you going to get to them? And what are you going to do with the others when you use them? You're just going to be putting guns everywhere. It's, it's no, not really help. Having, having 12 six-shooters is not any help at all. So here's the next sort of generation of these vessels. And again, please notice something on the <laughs> on this side. <laughs> we have the Majestic class, we have the Canopus class, we have the Formidable class, we have the Dunk the London class. And as you can see, the Japanese have entered here. And yes, they are getting these built in the UK. Uh, the Geyserlich Marine has the Kaiser Frederick class, which are just coming along. They're quite nice ships. They're definitely improved, and they have Wittelsbach, which is a one-off, and she's a good little ship. Again, the French are um, managing to keep produce one-offs. Uh, if we go back to this earlier one, you'll notice that the French do have a habit of keep producing one-offs, and then they have a little class. They do about four one-offs, and then they do a little class. Well, the, the, the French continue this joy with well, they have about three one-offs in here, and they have a little class. The Charlemagne class with Saint-Louis and Galois. The US Navy have the Kearsarge, which are really quite cool ones. And Illinois class. For, start, for some reason, the first Illinois class to launch is Alabama. So, whilst that class is known as the Illinois class, let's be honest, the first one to reach Wardock was Alabama. Which is, which is appropriate. 
The Italian Navy have entered the race with the Amalagos de San Bon class. And they have built two ships. I was including, considering adding on the Austrians into this, but that would just add me and I make it look like an another stream of black with occasionally um, a couple of ships peering up. And this is the trouble. At a certain point, I was, wasn't even sure about including the Italians in this, but they are a big factor of the later naval races because of their technology approach, technological approach. So it seemed appropriate to put them in. But it's kind of like the Russians and, to an extent, the French. It's just... It just makes it look even worse. From the perspective of the Royal Navy are building, are pretty much building enough ships that they are built uh, that anyone else in the world can turn up with better ships. The Royal Navy can turn up with about six. Oh yes, you have the individually superior vessel. We agree, sir. Meet twelve. Enjoy. Oh, you, you, this is sort of the period when you have almost a, you have the two power standard going on. But let's be honest, the Royal Navy build two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, in the time that the supposed fo focus of the two power standards, the Russians, uh, build six and the French build four. And uh, let me sound corrected five. So um. They build, between them, 11 ships, the French and Russians. The British build 16. Um, I'm not saying that there is an overmatch going on here, but if I didn't know better, I'd say the Royal Navy was compensated for something, or they were trying to keep their maritime industry artificially high. But there is an advantage to this, because the Royal Navy are able to pursue a very evolutionary process with these ships. So, whereas between some of these classes you will see some big jumps on the other navies, with the Royal Navy class they sort of fix in form and they slowly change, and you almost don't realise they're changing, they're changing, changing, until you're looking at the final class and going, Wow, you are really quite different to the ones that started... When did that... How did that change happen? And it's literally it's because the Royal Navy are keeping up this constant drumbeat of construction. They're not launching a lot of ships every year, but they're launching enough. And the Majestic class, they've got 12-inch guns. It happens. Sorry, Royal Navy, it does happen. And these were, ba these were based definitely on the Royal Sovereigns. It's supposed to be improved Royal Sovereigns. They have nine inches of belt armor. They have two and a half to four inches of deck armor. They have 14 inches on the conning tower and 14 inches on the barbettes. They carry 12 six inch guns, 16 12 pounder, that's 76 millimeter guns, and 12 three pounder, 40, that's 47 millimeter quick firing guns, and five 18 inch torpedo tubes. Because, you know, who doesn't want five 18 inch torpedo tubes? Sorry. Before you think I was hurting my dog, I was just gripping grabbing something out of his eye. I could edit that out, but then that the noise might end up and then people were just wondering, what, are you hurting a dog? No, I'm just cleaning his eye. He didn't want it done earlier. He thought because I was distracted he was safe. Papas remember. Anyway, the Majestic class are pretty good ships and the Royal Navy builds nine of them. Majestic, Victorious, Magnificent, Mars, Hannibal, Illustrious, Prince George, Caesar and Jupiter. Which is also another interesting thing to think about because when you're considering they've got nine Majestics and you start looking at all these vessels and you go back to the previous construction you go, well, hang on, the Royal Navy has built more of one class than some navies have in their entire fleet at this point. That's capacity. And when we talk about this period, when you consider the amount they're building, no one turns around and goes, bro, oh, yeah, Britain's spending too much on the fence. No one, Britain's, you know, overtaxing its economy, spending on the fence. They're not. 
No one could look at the defence spending in the 1890s of the British government and go, you know what? You guys are being prolific. They're not. In fact, you could argue they are not spending enough. But the Royal Navy is churning out classes of battleships which are more numerous than the than the actual navy, uh, some of the navies, uh, other navies in the world. Now, again, you can point out the Royal Navy has the world's largest maritime empire to protect and secure, so they need those ships. And you'd be quite right. But still, that's a fairly hefty production amount coming through. And then we get on to the next batch. Okay. Look who's just entered the race. Hello, America. I mean... You showed up. You showed up well. Small issue. You, you showed up at the point at which the Royal Navy is built the Duncans, the Londons, the King Edwards, the Swifters, and, you know, again, King Edwards are another good example of a very large class. Where the Royal Navy churns out eight of them. The, the Kaiserlich Marine are starting to pick up their production. True. They are. But the French Navy are continuing to be... I'm not sure how anyone justified a scare of the French Navy at any point in this period, considering their construction rate. I mean, I know I'm going to be talking about the Juno Coal. Uh, not next week, but the week after, on the Tuesday. But... I don't know how anyone justified being afraid of the French Navy. Proximity, the other side of the English Channel, and the sheer, uh, the the fact that they're actually building any ships at all, and their history, yes, I can see in the French Army, certainly. And the idea being the French Navy will get the French Army to British shores, I, okay, that makes sense. But on sheer production alone, the Royal Navy's Channel Squadron probably could outnumber them two to one, and still leave plenty of fleet left over for the rest of the world. I mean, the only nation you really have to worry about in terms of construction terms here is America, because they are the only ones who are actually managing to turn their ships around in a fairly decent time. And even then, they have to take huge gaps between construction, because the Congress has two modes when it comes to naval defence spending. Either the tap cannot be open no matter how much effort you put on that wrench no matter how much force or it's gushing they have no in-between nozzle it's either jam full on or full off which is why the US Navy is built in these gulps not always the most sensibly let's be honest we will get into the Virginia class design but they are built and again for the Russian Navy, Borodino class launched 1902-1903. You can see they are in a bit of a pickle. But not necessarily as much of a pickle as the Japanese. Because the Japanese battleships mostly came about in the previous set of years. So you can also start to understand why people were so sure that Russia was going to easily win the Russo-Japanese War. But there again, those same people seem to have not studied the, the sheer ge geographical um, limitations known as geography, uh, which is a immoral, hateful dictator, and logistics and maintenance, which are vile, vile de demons who will... <laughs> you could almost call them a version of Sukumbai, but, uh, no. Anyway, the Duncan class. The Duncan class. There were six of these. HMS Duncan, HMS Almar, HMS Cornwallis, HMS Exmouth, HMS Montague, and HMS Russell. 
six of them. And the argument is often that they were ordered in response to the press of, uh, the Perisavet class. You look at this. The Perisavet class are on the previous construction. These ones. There were only three of those. And whilst they are big, they are very, very, uh, how do I put this politely, French inclined. And they're armed with four twin 10-inch guns. This is for 12-inch guns. It has 12 6-inch guns. It has 10 12-pounder guns. It has six 3-pounder guns and four 18-inch torpedo tubes. All of them are submerged. It has a 7-inch armoured belt the whole way around. It has a bulkheads of between 11 and 7 inches thick. It has decks 2 to 1 inch thick, turrets 10 to 8 inch thick, barbettes 11 to 4 inch thick, casing mate 6 inch thick, and a conning tower 12 inch thick. It has 24 Belleville water tube boilers, such as supplying two triple expansion engines for a top speed of 19 knots via their two shafts, or a range of 6,070 nautical miles at 10 knots, and a crew of 720. And I can tell you one thing. I am absolutely certain of, absolutely beyond any, any doubt. That whilst the Royal Navy might have used the excuse of the theoretical battleship, Russian battleships being theoretically capable of, of achieving 19 knots to justify building their own 19 knot battleships. Not sure if you heard my mum issuing her instructions via camera then, but no. Um, the one thing I can be absolutely certain of, beyond the shadow of a doubt, is that the Duncan class and the London class, which preceded them, are built as. The Royal Navy wants more battleships to cover its space around the world. The Russians are a good excuse to point to. Oh, they got fast battleships. We need to build fast battleships. And the Royal Navy is not above focusing on other people to justify its construction program. But... And you can argue, oh, well, if the Russians have three, to guarantee the availability of three, you need at least three vessels. Uh, you need at least six vessels. At least six to guarantee the availability of three. Yes. Yes, you can justify that. But at this point, you you have the London class. You have all these ships down here compared to those Russian ships. The odds are you're going to have a lot of ships available. This is giving the Royal Navy even more preponderance of power, and the British government doesn't mind having the excuses given to it to give, uh, give that, because it just gives them a far bigger stick to walk around with. This construction, all this, is about the Terence. It's all about building not just a matching capability, but a significant overmatching capability that allows them to go, you really want to fight us. Does, do any of you really want to fight us? Because the trouble is, yes, you might have newer battleships. I'm going to point to America because they have this big block of new battleships. And they might be individually better than any one of our ships. But they're going to be facing about six ships to their one. So are they really better than any six of our ships? At which point, I am sure there is someone who... Quite happily in the comments will argue, yes, they could have taken them down. The answer is no. Cumulative damage as a sheer factor alone is going to have an impact. Before you get to the reality that I probably wouldn't turn up with six ships. I'd have three ships in the, per you in the battle and I'd have the other ships all off doing nasty damage elsewhere where you couldn't be because you're having to be concentrated to deal with the mighty fleet I've got. Or you're off in penny packets, in which case I've got squadrons of six ships showing up at every space you are, going, hello. 
Then after that comes the Swift Trade class, which were originally ordered as the Constitution class for Chile. They'd have been interesting vessels. They were ordered when Chile and Argentina were having their usual series of... Well, people describe it as high tension. I would say, actually, the Argentinian-Chilean border is a border of hypertension. As the only thing I can describe it as. Because nothing causes more British ambassadors to have heart attacks than getting an order from home you do realize they're arguing with each other again go and sort it out and stop a war because it's going to cause our trade issues and having to go and work with usually various people to try and bring peace in this period alternatively you then get the ambassadors who are quite happy to inflame the situation so they can order and get will get more orders of ships through uh, basically, you alternate. You either have one an ambassador who is doing one thing or an ambassador who is doing the other. And occasionally, they'll do both things, but in different terms of service. It's brilliant. Now, these vessels... They're kind of special. They're 19 knotters again. So, they, the Royal Navy has a, a fair number of uh, pre-dreads which can do 19 knots. But to get to their 90 knots, they're armed with 10-inch guns. They have 14 single 7.5-inch guns, though, so that's not bad. And uh, 14 uh, 14 pounder or 3-inch 76mm guns. 4 single 6-pounder guns, that's 57mm guns. And um, 2 18-inch torpedo tubes. Their armor belt is between 3 and 7 inches thick. And it's kind of an interesting belt in that you have this lower, sort of below the water, uh, water line, it, that sort of belt forward, which is three inches. You even have two inches on the front here to give it a sort of ram bow. And then the moment you get back to this bit, it goes up to about six, in uh, six inches and underneath the uh, turrets, and then seven inches uh, across the rest of the sort of the center point in the hull. They're good old ships. The end of service, they're completed in well, 1904, and the Royal Navy is pretty darn happy with them. They are built by Armstrong Whitworth L Ellswick Yard and Baron Furness Vickers. So they're built by good yards. So the Royal Navy's got it going, well, you know, if we have to take them on, we will do. Um, it's, a, it's a hard life, but it's, it's, it's something we'll do. Triumph. The other, the sister, 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 actually participated in the hunt for the German East Asia Squadron, and served in the campaign against the colony of Tsingtao, until she took part in refit in Hong Kong. She had actually been on the China Station from 1913, and is one of the ships which almost comes dashing across the Pacific. And it's rather interesting point of view is what happens if. Swifter's sister, HMS Triumph, manages to actually end up at Coronel. Because if she had left, or if any of the big ships really had left in time, they could have theoretically made it to Coronel in time to meet up with with Craddock, especially with their, using their radios and other systems to try and keep in contact. And if you had a 19 knot battleship there, even with 10-inch guns. Even with only 10-inch guns. It would have been an interesting addition to the force. It would have possibly caused a little bit of worry amongst the uh, gentlemen of the Kaiser Marine, and could well have caused the East Asia Squadron to decide that it preferred not to take part in the battle. It's one of those things. It's a very little amount of extra force for the British at Coronel could switch it completely in terms of, it, of what happened. Mainly because the armoured cruisers sent were, well, there was one the right one and one definitely not the right one to send to that sort of engagement. One of them was an armoured cruiser which was designed to beat destroyers off a fleet and it was sent out to an independent sailing mission. 
specialist ships. And then we have the Virginia class. Okay. So someone has a bright idea, and this is perhaps why when people turn around and go, well, obviously the reason the Royal Navy is doing a tech advance and they're doing the tech stuff they do end up doing with HMS uh, Dreadnought is because of the American build-up. And I go, well, that's certainly a case you can make. I think the reason the Royal Navy is jumping into it is because you can either be, you have to be, uh, you can either be first or you can be the best, or you can try for both, and that's what Dreadnought tries for. Dreadnought tries to be the first and the best of what could be built at the time to really lay down a marker so that it preserves British security, and it does work for roughly a decade. The trouble is the British government doesn't want to invest in doing the overmatch which it had been doing to preserve peace for the previous 20 odd years. That is the trouble. They were trying to save money with the Dreadnought. That's what they went into Dreadnought with, was saving money. Whereas if they'd gone into Dreadnought with the same idea they'd gone into the sovereign battleships and the battleships before it, they could probably have stopped war by just building enough ships. And let's be honest, which is cheaper? Fighting World War One or building a load of dreadnoughts? Which is cheaper? Now, the Virginia class are, as you can see, interesting. Specifically because the bright idea. The bright idea they have is to mount their 8-inch guns in four twin turrets, of which two of those turrets were superimposed on top of the 12-inch turrets. Now, can we all think about that particular thing for a second? Because you're mounting your 8-inch guns and their ammunition feed on top of your 12-inch guns. You're mounting 8-inch guns, which have a turret which has 165 uh, millimeters of armor on top of your 12 inch guns which have 279 millimeters of armor what well, for the 12 inch guns have 305 millimeters on sorry misreading it it's just it's um I'm just... I know someone had a bright idea. I realise it, but... Honestly, I can only say this. I think potentially. Potentially. We must accept. That a French naval architect managed to get into the American Ship Design Bureau. That is the only option. Because I realise this is a similar reaction to the idea of the Battle of Lisa and various other things happening, happening, which is you need to have forward fire so you can charge through the enemy lines. And this does give you six 8-inch guns firing forward, or theoretically six firing uh, six firing aft, etc. And all that, I, I, I understand that. But I also do not understand... What stops someone simply putting a piece of superstructure behind the 12-inch turret and mounting the 8-inch gun on the superstructure instead of putting it on top of the turret? Because I'm fairly certain the vibrations of the 12-inch guns firing are going to do great things for the 8-inch guns firing mechanism. Let alone the fact that if the 8-inch gun get mechanism above gets hit 
by something that go, makes it go kaboom, that could well call, knock out your 12-inch gun. And especially if you consider the ammunition feed for the 8-inch gun surely goes through the 12-inch gun. There's just... Someone had some bright ideas. I know, I know. But that's going to have to be a whole video at some point. The bright idea fairy hits the US Navy. Schleswig Holstein of the Deutschen class. And yes, I do enjoy saying Schleswig Holstein. Mainly because every time I, uh, I challenge one of my colleagues to say it, from ship shape. They look at me as if I'm being particularly cruel. They're a good class, the Deutschen class. They really are. They are the pre dreadnoughts which fight at the Battle of Jutland. Pomman? Well. She is sunk at the Battle of Jutland. by British destroyers. And so is probably the largest German loss of the day. But this class are important for many reasons. One, they don't just start off the love of the 11-inch guns. The Germans have been in love of 11 inch guns for a while by this point. The Braschwick class had them, uh, Wieselbach class didn't have them, and uh, Kaiser Fredericks, did they have them? No, they didn't have them. But no, you know, the Germans have been in love with, uh, in love with the 11 inch guns since the, Bra uh, the Braschwick class. What they do, though, is because they are still in service in the interwar years, they are the ships which German navies allowed to retain. They become the reason that their 11-inch guns in still in production in Germany, that they still have the systems to maintain and prepare 11-inch guns, which is why the Deutschen class have 11-inch guns, and Neisner and Scharnhorst have 11-inch guns because of this class. These were the first vessels which were ordered under the second naval law. The Wieselbach class had built the um, had built been built under the first naval law. But these vessels, the Deutschland class, were the second naval law. And they were this great idea of his because they were going to really ramp up the strength of the German Navy. And if we look at this, the rest of the Wieselbach class had been built in, had been launched in 1901, roughly equivalent with the Duncans. Amazing, the Duncans are built as a reaction to the Russians, you know, but uh, yeah, it's the uh, Wieselbach class that they um, really rank in with. It's amazing, but it's the, it's the Russians they're being built for against. And the first Wieselbach had been launched in 1900. Then we have the Duncans. And then the Barshwood class start. And amazingly, then come the Londons and the King Edwards. But, you know, they're being built because of the Russians. They are being built because of the Russians. And the French. Then we have the Swiftstrick class. The Braunschweigs are, fi are finished off with the King Edwards, but the King Edwards see the start of the Deutschland class. And the King Edwards keep coming, well, along with the Deutschlands. So this class keeps coming. And, honestly, they match up with the Lord Nelsons. They match up with Connecticut class, Vessel New Hampshire. Um, it's not quite the same. There are 
Honestly, I could have kept going with some navies because they do keep building this style of ship for a long period. The Japanese Navy had the Satsumas, and they and the Lord Nelsons are both fairly interesting. But the point that I often make when talking about this period is you're starting to get into what is sometimes known as the semi-dreadnoughts. And the Deutschlands are being continued on. And the Deutschlands have their 11-inch guns, as their primary guns, and then they have six... 0.7 inch guns. The Deutschlands aren't heading towards what's sometimes classified as semi dreadnought status. And it shows the basic thing again for the German Navy. It's one of the interesting, really interesting things. They are a technically very adept nation with a rich scientific and engineering background. And yet, their warship construction couldn't be more conservative. And the reason for that is because of all the naval laws, the cost requirements, the limitations put in. All these things have an effect on what they can actually do. On what they can actually be. And that's a problem for them. It really is. Lord Nelson class. Those are 12-inch guns and 9.2-inch guns. Yes, because... Really wanted to make a point. Really, really wanted to make a point. And apparently that point also included... 24 single 12-pounder, that's 3-inch guns. 12 3-pounder guns in single mounts. And 5 18-inch torpedoes. A waterline belt of 12 inches, an upper belt of 8 inches, uh, between 1 and 4 inches of armour on the various, on some of the armoured decks. Barbettes, 3 to 12 inches thick. Main gun turrets, 12 inches of thick armour. Secondary gun turrets, 8 inches thick at the front, 7 inches thick at the back. Conning tower, 12 inches, and bulkheads of 8 inch thickness. The Royal Navy builds Lord Nelson at Agamemnon. The thing is, you can view these as lots of things. You can view this as the next natural progression of the Royal Navy's class. While they're building Dreadnought. You can also view the fact that, in many ways, these are insurance for Dreadnought. If Dreadnought doesn't work out, the Royal Navy still has two of the most powerful battleships in the world. If Dreadnought turns out to be a flop, no one really wants to take on a Lord Nelson class. Certainly not in a Deutschen class. It's a good looking ship. But that'll poke a lot of big holes in you. I think you can tell the point at which the Royal Navy is moving technology and worrying about technology and pushing its technology forward and you can tell the points when it's worried about numbers because the Royal Navy tends to adopt a small classes to push techno technology forward and then do a big class order so when you see them ordering eight ships nine ships in a class that's usually the point at which they are fairly happy with technology and they want to order a nice squadron when they're ordering a couple of ships they're developing the technology. But what's interesting is how other nations are handling it. Because the Royal Navy is kind of the exception. Because the Royal Navy is building quite so many ships. The other reason you can think for the US Navy's sort of blah of construction and then stopping is that they're taking time to evaluate what they've built. They launch it, they test it, and then they design new stuff. So the US Navy is basically going through cycles of construct, evaluate, construct, construct, evaluate, construct, construct, evaluate, construct. We'll ignore the French Navy. The Russian Navy is just building whatever they can. And 
the Kaiserlich Marine, well, they change. They start off by building, yeah, we've got some battleships. And then nothing. Nothing. And then it's sort of, it's 1896. Yeah, we'll start some construction off. What are we going to build? Ah, the Kaiser Friedrich the Third class. We're going to launch one vessel in 1896, another one in 1897, and the remaining two in 1899. Oh, and the foot. Uh, we're going to launch a uh, fifth one in 1890. In uh, 1890. Or no, that's 1900. Sorry, in 1900. At the same time as we launched the Vidasback class. Start off with Vidasback, and then we're going to do the rest of the Vidasback construction. And then they have, you know, they push out the Vidasback as fast as they can. And that's the Brashvik. And again, it's 1892, 18, it's 1902, 1903, 1904. And then Deutschland's, 1904, 1905. 1906. The thing is, for the US Navy, you can pretty much, as a independent company, you can work out when the cycles are going to be ticking up and when the cycles are going to be ticking down. For the Royal Navy, there's always something seems to be going on. For the Japanese Navy, the Royal Navy will have the British Yards will happily take your paychecks and cash them. The French, it's just all over the place. The Italians are They build something. But no. The Germans are trying to grow their industry. But the trouble is when they could have been growing it, they were building nothing. They they just suddenly turn up and go, we want to build a massive, we want to build up our navy. And that's where these problems start to arrive. Because you think they left it for years. Think about the fulfilling and the expense of a building facility that can turn out the level of armor and engineering and hull structure you need to be able to build a battleship. Especially as the size keeps going up. And you get left for... Well... For four years, pretty much. And then, when you do get... There are some more orders. Those orders... They might be ordered at roughly the same time, but... You're going to... Stretch out the work, aren't you? Because otherwise, how are you going to afford to pay for your yard? Which might explain why the Kaiser Friedrich the Third class has a whole year of eighteen ninety eight where none of them are launched. From that point onwards the Germans managed to get into yearly launches, but you're talking about normally two ships. One year it peaks in three, one year it drops down to one, but normally it's two ships a year. Which is going to build them up a capability, but it's not going to build them up fast. It's going to allow continued investment. But it's not going to allow it to be built up for, for quickly. And uh, for the US, their system is going to make their stuff expensive because you're going to have to factor in, as a shipyard, into your costs, the fact of not having construction for the following year. Or two years. On that slipway. And slipways are expensive things to build and maintain. Yes, you can fill in some of that gap by putting in stuff which doesn't require the full capability of that slipway. True, you can do.
But that's not going to be its most efficient use, and it's not going to give you the most efficient income, is it? But here's one of those other interesting ships being built, and this is the sort of where you get into the point of, yeah, are we talking about a semi-dreadnought here? Because this one has four 12-inch guns, the Satsuma class of the Japanese, and 12 10-inch guns in six twin turrets. It's basically a much better version, or you could argue, of the Lord Nelsons, which have 10 9.2-inch guns. This one is longer. It has 6 10-inch, and it's capable of 20 knots. Still has, um, well, Satsuma has triple expansion steam engines. Aki, the second one of us in the class, has steam turbines. And these are ships which, how do I put this politely, which the German Navy goes out of its way to try and avoid in World War One. These are some of the ships which the East Asiatic Squadron are going, we would really rather not bump into you. We would really rather not, because you can do 20 knots. And that is a problem for us. That is a problem because Sharnos and Eisenhower, they can do 22 and a half knots. But two and a half knots is not going to necessarily get them away quickly enough. And of course, that's going to depend on how rough the seas are. Anyway. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And what is today's question going to be? Well, today's question is going to be... I'm going to go with the question option number four. Sorry, I got them listed, uh, listed there and I was just looking at them. Number four is a simple one, but it's a good one. After looking through this no the numbers on this and seeing the production ratios and what's being built, do you find it plausible? at any point that any production by at least the Royal Navy was simply as put due to uh, the production of anyone else? Or was it more a case of we are producing these ships but we are going to produce a characteristic in them as a response to someone else or justified by someone else a characteristic that we desire? I'd love to hear your thoughts about this one, because that is a lot of construction. And you're going to start seeing more and more of these construction tables, because I found my old Excel spreadsheet, which had all these tables written up. And I started turning them into slides, because I used to use them in teaching a lot. And I hadn't been able to find a few years ago, I'm going to have to rebuild those. And then I went, hang on, what about my really old... It's going to sound really strange. My really old portable hard drive, which is in the bright green box, because all my portable hard drives, all my backup portable hard drives, are in different coloured boxes. I've got to buy one before I go to Australia. Um, but where's the one now? The, the one I'm currently backing stuff up on at the moment is this box. Is it in this box? Stored in this box, normally. So, why? They're all different colours as a may of me storing them. So I remember each one differently. So everyone's in a different colour. So yes, I do have bright pink. Bright green. I have. I don't care. The colours are different. Went to search it. Found them. And so they're going to start appearing. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And take care. I'll leave you on a better picture than that. Mm, I'll leave you with the bright idea fairy.
must have been such a bright idea.